Okay, yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this new lecture of computer architecture course. Uh, this is lecture eight and today we are going to continue with the topic that Professor Moodlu started two lectures ago and we continued yesterday. Um, it's processing in memory. Yesterday we uh, focused, we spent the whole lecture talking about one of the uh, key trends in processing in memory, which is called processing using memory. Um, we are going to very quickly recap today on this, um, on this trend, and we will cover the second uh, main trend in processing in memory, which is called processing near memory. We will see different ways of doing processing near memory today. So this is the sub agenda of uh, the memory computation lectures. After explaining the major trends affecting main memory, uh, Professor Moodle talk about the need for intelligent memory controllers. And then we started talking about the two main directions in processing in memory. As I said yesterday, uh, processing using memory, today processing near memory. And we will also conclude uh, this um, um, like the set of lectures um, on, on a discussion about how to enable the adoption of processing in memory and, and finally some uh, con concluding remarks. Okay, so let's quickly recap on what we discussed yesterday, processing using memory. Remember that processing using memory is a way of uh, uh, doing processing in memory that um, happens inside the memory array. And it happens inside the memory array because it takes advantage of the uh, analog uh, operation of uh, memory cells. In particular, we focused yesterday on DRAM cells, but we also talk about other types of uh, memory technologies, like for example, MVMs, we talk about PCM, RERAM and restores, et cetera, that can also be used for processing in memory. For example, the uh, main restore, uh, main restore uh, crossbar arrays that can be used for uh, computation of deep neural networks. Um, one of the uh, works that we explained with uh, some detail is Roclon, which was probably the first uh, proposal, the first project that took advantage of the analog operation of DRAM cells to uh, perform some sort of computation. In principle, something pretty simple, which is uh, data copy and initialization, but then, we uh, continue develop ID, develop, developing ideas in this direction of processing using DRAM. And the next work was this uh, fast bulk bitwise AND and OR in DRAM, uh, where we found a way of performing uh, bulk bitwise operations inside DRAM. And that was later extended in the AMBIT paper presented in Micro 2017 that already provided a way of um, um, implementing different operations based on and, or, and not, which, as you know, uh, conform a, a functionally complete um, um, set. So with this functionally complete set, we can uh, implement more complex operations, arbitrary operations, and that's uh, what we continue doing. Um, in this uh, book chapter, you can see an extended version of the AMBIT paper and the ideas that were presented in both AMBIT and Roclon were tested on in of the of the shell uh, chips, real chips that are uh, already commercially available, not designed for processing using DRAM, but um, these folks here uh, in their compute DRAM paper showed that even in chips that have not been designed for processing using DRAM, it's possible to do uh, processing using DRAM in some way. And that's um, not only in DRAM, other memory technologies, as I said, and we talk about the Pina Tubo paper um, um, presented in DAC 2016. As I said, after having the ability of moving data inside DRAM, sorry, after having the ability of moving data inside DRAM and also uh, performing some simple operations in DRAM, simple operations like these bitwise operations and or and not, we came up with a way of exploiting this uh, computation capability in a more uh, structured and organized manner, proposing this SIM DRAM framework for bit serial SIM processing using uh, DRAM. By the way, there will be next week uh, a Safari Live seminar uh, uh, given by Nastaran, who is uh, one of the first authors of uh, SIMDRAM 
she would be talking on October 27th about her PhD thesis that includes these CIMD-run work. So probably you uh, want to join and, and learn, learn more about this interesting proposal. Okay, so we are done with processing using memory. Now let's uh, start with the next uh, important direction or the second important direction that we call processing near memory. As you know, here, the point is to think in a different way, in a different manner from past approaches. We want to see memory as, as an accelerator. And uh, in some sense, this is similar to a conventional accelerator. Main differences with a conventional accelerator, as I explained yesterday, is that we are reducing the amount of data movement that is needed a lot. Uh, first of all, because uh, uh, mem the CPU can, can communicate, or the SOC, maybe including even uh, GPU cores, can communicate with memory through the memory bus. So it's not like an um, external um, bus similar to P I, like PCI Express. Um, so here, potentially, we can have uh, also more bandwidth in this memory bus. And then we have these um, specialized uh, compute capable units in memory that uh, uh, are uh, either uh, inside the memory itself, if we are using one processing using memory technique or near the memory and that and, and this way enjoying very low latency of access to data and very high bandwidth. Okay, so in the uh, processing, processing, um, processing near memory approach, uh, the key idea, as you already know, is placing compute units near the memory, not inside the memory itself, but near the memory or or depending on how you see memory, because memory is a, a whole hierarchy of, for example, in the case of DRAM, bank, subarrays, et cetera. So there, may, there might be different places where we, uh, where we put the logic and the compute units that we are going to use in our processing in memory techniques. So one of the uh, ways that uh, has been quite successful in recent years is using uh, 3D stack memories. Um, in the end, uh, 3D stack memories are a response from industry uh, to deal with uh, some of the issues that uh, DRAM scaling has. You are already familiar with them. And here, the key idea of uh, 3D stack memories is to um, uh, uh, stack multiple layers of, uh, of memory, like uh, these ones, as you can see in the figure, together with some logic layer where we can play some uh, elements to access the memory. And these elements are essentially memory controllers. As we will discuss today, and as you will see in the next um, few slides, these memory layers are typically partitioned into some vertical sections. And each of these vertical sections is attached to one small memory controller that resides in the logic layer. This is in particular the proposal from the hybrid memory cube consortium, but there are other uh, 3D memories of, of this type as well. Even more successful that, than high, the hybrid memory cube is the uh, uh, the HVM memory with different versions already, HVM2, HVM2E, and um, but essentially uh, it's uh, built in a very similar way. Multiple layers of DRAM memory and a logic layer at the bottom. The good thing of this logic layer, and this is why many people got encouraged about uh, doing processing in memory research using this type of devices, is that in this logic layer, there is some area that is occupied by these memory controllers that I mentioned connected to each of the bolts in which the, the, the memory layers are partition, uh, but also there is some extra area. And we can use this extra area to play some compute elements, depending on the different proposals that we have seen in the past um, few years, I would say five, uh, six years. Uh, these um, um, processing elements can be of different types. You will see, and actually in, in today's lecture, you will, you will see more specialized accelerators or maybe even like very fine grained and simplified units that can execute uh, certain operations only, or you will see uh, more complex designs that may uh, include uh, in order cores, for example, that are uh, general purpose and allow us to perform more uh, variety of computations. But that's uh, in the end, more or less the idea. And today actually in the, uh, three proposals that we are going to see in more detail, uh, we will uh, talk about um, 3D stack memories. We, so they, they, they have been tested and implemented in 3D stack memories, which as I said, doesn't mean that this is the only 
way of doing processing near memory, right? So it is a, this is a successful trend, but not the only one. Actually, in the, in the next lecture next week, we will talk in detail about the AppMem PIM architecture. And as you will see, this is also processing near memory, but it's different in the sense that it's not using 3D stack memory, it's using two-dimensional DRAM memory, uh, DDR4 memory, and placing the compute elements near the bank, not in a separate logic layer, but inside the memory itself. Okay, or near the memory array. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I was talking about different um, um, types of, uh, of um, three stack memory. I, we have seen in the previous slide HMC. I mentioned also HVM, for example, the Samsung Fin DRAM proposal that uh, you're already familiar with. Uh, uh, it's uh, built uh, on HVM memory. In that case, also similar to the AppMem case, the, the, the compute units are not in the logic layer, but near the bank in the uh, memory layers. And here you can see um, a few more of these um, standards. Actually, HVM is here as well. Okay, and there are um, several questions in uh, 3D stack team, and in general, in processing near memory. Um, the, the, the first question that we uh, want to answer is what should be the granularity of the compute units that we uh, place near memory? Do we want to do something that is like um, a coarse grain accelerator where we complete, uh, com may like uh, change uh, the system in a, in a um, significant manner, or we want to do some sort of minimal changes to the system uh, to enable processing in memory. These are the, uh, let's say, two possible directions that we are going to cover in the next slide. So here we can uh, talk about some more coarse grain accelerator or fine grain accelerator. In a more coarse, coarse grain accelerator, what we will normally do is um, offloading um, a whole chunk of computation, maybe a whole application or maybe a whole kernel or function. In the other trend, we will offload individual operations. And you will see that each of them has its own pros and cons and, and each of them uh, can be more suitable for um, individual different case studies. Let's uh, start with the first one, the coarse grain accelerator. And here um, we also see two different uh, trends in some ways. So one of them is uh, changing the entire system you will see a coarse grain accelerator in the next slides where we offload the whole application and we let this whole uh, this accelerator to compute the whole application. In some other cases, we identify some functions uh, that are relatively simple um, that are, and, and are good to uh, be offloaded to ping. So in the sense we, even though in both cases, we are talking about a relatively coarse grain um, processing in memory acceleration, we also see like two different ways of doing it here. And then the other um, uh, possibility, as I uh, said before, is uh, providing minimal processing in memory support where uh, the changes to the system and programming are minimal, almost negligible. So as you will see, each of them is different, different use cases will be targeted and um, different pros and cons in each of them. But let's uh, start with the, uh, let's say, a coarser one, which is the, 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 the proposal that changes the entire system. And, um, and, and, the, and the case that we are going to study now is a coarse grain accelerator that was designed for graph processing. Graphs are uh, very important workloads. Graph processing is more and more important these days because graphs are used uh, in, everywhere right so here you have uh, for example some exam some examples of uh, graphs from uh, social networks usually very large graphs with uh, millions of nodes and a lot of connections between these nodes and processing these graphs is challenging for uh, one important reason and you as, as we will see in the next slide the way that they access memory is not really very efficient in the sense that they are not exploiting every data that is read from memory. These um, graph processing workloads um, typically show uh, very uh, frequent random memory accesses. And, and that uh, causes that the um, exploitation of the bandwidth is not very optimal. And actually that's what we can see in this uh, plot. Even though in this example, we are increasing the number of cores from 
32 to 128, which is four times more cores, the speed up that we achieve is only 42%. And the reason for that is that due to the frequent memory accesses and irregular memory accesses, the bandwidth saturates, and these um, 128 cores, even though we have four times the number of cores as uh, in this case, uh, we cannot achieve a higher speed up. And this is because, as I said, the characteristics of the graph processing workloads. This is some simple code from a very popular and, and important algorithm, which is uh, PageRank. In PageRank, what we uh, typically do is uh, visiting the vertices in one graph, and then from each vertex, we go to all successors of this vertex, all neighbors of this vertex, and update the rank value of each of the individual successors based on the rank of the uh, own vertex. And as you can see, the computation that we have here is um, pretty simple, uh, pretty lightweight. Um, we just need a multiplication and one addition. But the problem in this workload is that um, the accesses to memory are inefficient because they are random. There are uh, frequent random memory accesses. And why is that? The reason is that for each vertex, we have a list, we can have a list of neighbors that is here, right? But where these neighbors reside might be in very um, scattered places in memory. So it will be difficult that for each individual vertex, we have all neighbors residing next to each other. That will normally happen maybe in very small graphs, but not in the large graphs that we have to process today. So due to this type of random memory accesses, it's difficult to take full advantage of the available bandwidth. And these causes that these workloads are highly memory bound. And they are also highly memory bound because as you know, there is also very little amount of computation. So we have to go to memory, bring one whole cache line. We will probably not even use the whole cache line completely because we want to access a single successor node and then we perform some computation that is pretty lightweight. We don't uh, reuse the, the access data um, very much. It's just one multiplication and one addition. And probably this cache line that will stay in the cache uh, for some time um, uh, and maybe um, maybe hit uh, sometime later, at some point it will get evicted. And when we uh, again need to update the rank of this vertex, for example, we will probably have to go again to DRAM, bring it to the uh, cache hierarchy and then repeat the operation. And this is what is um, overwhelming the, uh, the memory bandwidth and the access to data. So uh, the proposal here is the so-called Tesseract Accelerator or Tesseract System for Graph Processing, which is an interconnected set of three stack memory and logic chips uh, with simple cores. Uh, here, as I said, this was um, implemented in using 3D stack memory, in particular considering the HMC memory, but there may, there may be uh, other ways of implementing it as well. The, the general concept is processing near memory, the actual memory technology that we use to implement it uh, might change. Um, but yeah, in, in the, in the uh, paper itself presented in, in ISCA 2015, this is the assumption, 3D stack memory. And as you can see, it's a coarse grain accelerator in a similar way as uh, we are using GPUs these days with a uh, completely uh, separate accelerator that is connected uh, through uh, to the host processor, to the host CPU uh, using some a certain interface, like for example, PCI Express could be. And then the accelerator itself is composed by uh, a set of uh, 3D stack chips, as you can see in this part of the figure. So um, now uh, we will have to map the graph onto these um, uh, different stacks, right? Different stacks of uh, memory and logic. Uh, why is that? Because usually the graphs are pretty large. We may be talking about uh, several gigabytes for each of the graphs and or even more. And probably um, we don't have, we cannot have the whole graph in a single stack of these, right? So because maybe the size of these is like two gigabytes, four gigabytes or something like that. So probably your graph will span many more of these uh, 3D stack chips, right? And, and what this means is that some of the vertices will be in some of the 
um, in some of the um, stacks. And the neighbors of these vertices might be in the same stack, and for example, in this case, or might be in different stacks. And uh, in order to perform the computation in an efficient manner, we will have to figure out ways of accessing not only the own data, the data residing in the same stack in an efficient manner, but also the data that is um, remote uh, access it as well, or compute on this data as well in an efficient manner. Now, if we take a closer look at each of these um, individual stacks, we will see that the layout of them looks like this, more or less. So this is actually what you have uh, here is a, what we can find in the logic layer. And on top of them, uh, we have uh, in the logic layer. And on top of the logic layer, we have uh, like several memory layers. Uh, so and if you take a closer look, you will see that in the logic layer, we have uh, some in order cores. So we have these compute units here that are connected through a uh, network, uh, so a crossbar network. And, and, and you can uh, take a closer look at the uh, internals of each of these uh, individual processing elements where you will find an in-order core. This might be, I guess, a small ARM core, for example, connected to the DRAM controller. Recall that this um, 3D stack memory is partitioned into multiple vertical bolts called bolts, and in each bolt, we find a DRAM controller to access the data in these folds. So the in-order core uh, sends load and store requests to this uh, DRAM controller and the DRAM controller accesses data in the layers. And there are a few more components that we will uh, continue explaining uh, in the next slides. And by the way, here you can also see this uh, network interface for each of the cores to communicate with other cores in the same uh, 3D stack memory or in other 3D stack memories of the system. Okay, so yeah, um, one um, thing that I already mentioned is the fact that uh, we have um, uh, uh, communication. So we, 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 we are going to need a way of communicating from one of these um, cores and from one of these uh, stacks to other stars, stacks or from one of these cores to other cores in the same stack, right? And this is uh, why we need to use these communications via remote function calls. We are going to see in the next slides how to do it. Uh, in order to support these communications via remote function calls, we use a um, message queue that you can see um, here. So let's talk about the communications. This is the same code that we have seen before. It's uh, the, code, the code with uh, um, I mean, page rank code where uh, we have a vertex and we visit the successors of this vertex or this uh, graph node, and then we update the rank of the successors, right? Uh, so in some of the cases, it will be great because we will have, um, I, it will be easy, let's say, because we will have the successors of the uh, node residing in the same vault uh, or residing at least in the same 3D memory stack and the access will be uh, pretty fast and efficient. But in other cases, because as I said, the graph is huge and we have to map uh, the whole graph onto many, if not all the uh, 3D stack uh, cubes that we have in the system, uh, it may turn out that we have to uh, perform a remote access. And, and for example, here we are assuming that the um, um, original node V is uh, in bold one and we have the remote node, uh, not, not the remote node, the, the successor node W residing in another bold. And as I said, this bold might be in the same stack or might be in a different stack. So when this happens, what is clear is that we cannot compute this directly in one in-order core. Why is that? Because this in-order core doesn't have direct access to W, uh, to, 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 to the, the values of W, right? So in this case is where we use one of these remote function calls. And in particular, the Tesseract paper proposes two ways of doing uh, remote function calls. One of them is blocking, the other one is non-blocking. In the case of blocking, what this means is that uh, every time that uh, one thread running on a in-order core um, executes one remote function call, it has to wait until the operation, the function call has been completed. And in, other, in the other case, which is uh, actually more efficient because it doesn't um, stop the execution of the course, is the non-blocking 
remote function call. Uh, it has um, this shape, as you can see here, this syntax, uh, the, the, the function itself, the function call itself is called uh, put. And here we have an identifier of the successor node. And we also define a function, a small function that we want to apply to this W here, right? And then uh, there is one, uh, let's say source uh, in source core that uh, um, you, um, that calls this remote function. And then this remote function goes to a remote node to another uh, core in the system to be executed. And uh, it's non-blocking in the sense that the, uh, the, the, the core, the source core that uh, uh, creates this remote function call doesn't have to wait for the other core to complete the execution. It can continue the computing. And then at some point, at some point, uh, we use one barrier to make sure that the other end has finished the computation. So this is why computation can be delayed until the nearest barrier. So this is uh, how it works. There are three different steps in the first. So th these are the, the, the cores that uh, we are uh, talking about. We have a local core that uh, executes the uh, or calls this remote function. And then we have a remote core, core that will execute the remote function. So uh, in the first step, uh, we send the function address and arguments to the remote core using the put API um, and uh, sending the identifier of the node that needs to be updated and the function that we are going to apply on this node. This call is received in the network interface of the remote core and is stored in this message queue for the remote core code to, um, to um, uh, let's say, um, to execute the function uh, when, when um, finds the, the right time to do it. And then this will uh, happen either when the flash, uh, when the message queue is full or when a synchronization barrier is reached. Uh, the thing is that the remote code is executing its own code as well, right? And at some point it will have to stop from its own execution and uh, pay attention to the messages and the, and the requests, external requests uh, that uh, are in this message queue. And this may happen either when the message queue is full or when a synchronization barrier is reached in the, uh, in the local core. Then there is another uh, interesting or important technique that is used in the Tesseract system to uh, to make it even more efficient and, and be able to exploit more bandwidth. And that's uh, prefetching. And there is, there is prefetching in two different ways. Um, on, on the one hand, we have a line prefetcher that uh, sends requests to this uh, P, um, uh, so a prefetching buffer where we uh, store uh, the, the, the prefetch data. And this uh, line uh, prefetcher is fetching the next cache lines from the own DRAM uh, controller. In some other cases, we receive the request, the prefetching request from the message queue. They may be coming from uh, remote function calls from other core. And, um, and this message trigger prefetcher, um, um, it's, uh, it's, um, in, uh, it's in charge of uh, bringing data uh, from the memory controller, from the uh, with the, using the DRAM controller, that is going to be used later uh, to satisfy the uh, remote function calls. So these are the two types of prefetchers that are using the Tesseract system. And maybe some of you might think, okay, why using uh, prefetchers here if uh, you know in, in reality you are in a processing in memory system and you have uh, quite good uh, bandwidth, high bandwidth already, right? Um, yeah, that's a good question, and actually the. The answer is that even though um, the processing in memory system has a very high bandwidth, still the um, uh, local caches that each of the core, uh, cores have are pretty small. And this makes that even data that is going to be very frequently reused needs to be fetched from um, DRAM again, again, from the DRAM layers again and again, right? And, and um, because many of these accesses can be um, like, uh, skipped if we um, have like a larger cache or we have uh, other techniques. In this case, we implement uh, prefetching. We can definitely 
um, in the end exploit higher bandwidth from using prefetching. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so if there are no questions, then I'm going to continue with um, I'm going to continue with the evaluation of the Tesseract system. Uh, in, the, in this work, there were three uh, different baselines that were used and they were compared to the Tesseract system. And here in the slide, you can see now the three baseline systems. So two of them use, uh, let's say, um, general CPUs, like uh, general purpose processor CPUs, out of order CPUs, um, these are, uh, these two uh, baselines that you can see on the left, um, these, uh, each of them uh, have uh, a total of 32 out of order cores running at four gigahertz. And the difference between these two is the memory that is um, in the system. In the, in the simplest case, we are using DDR3 memory that it's more conventional and provides uh, a bandwidth not, not so bad, more than 100 gigabytes per second, but definitely not enough for the type of operations, for the type of computation that we are targeting in this, in this project, right, in this work. So that's why another baseline considers HMC memory, and because it's a 3D stack memory, it's possible to achieve much higher uh, memory bandwidth from the out of order cores. So we replace the DDR3 themes with um, HMC stacks, and these will provide the uh, host CPU with a peak bandwidth of 640 giga gigabytes per second. And then uh, the uh, third baseline is a variation of the previous one. Again, same memory, HMC, same bandwidth, 640 gigabytes per second in this system, but we replace the 32 out of order cores with uh, uh, a many core processor composed of 512 in order cores, as you can see. They run at a lower frequency, but we have many more of these. And then um, we evaluate Tesseract. Tesseract, uh, the, the implementation that we evaluate uh, contains 32 uh, Tesseract cores inside each of the stacks. So in total, because we have 16 stacks, this is uh, 512 cores as well. So it's the same number of cores as we also have in this baseline here. The key difference and the key advantage of Tesseract is that the internal bandwidth of the HMC memory is much higher than the external bandwidth that uh, these out of order cores or these in order cores can receive. And this internal bandwidth is as high as eight terabytes per second. And this is where the main advantage of Tesseract resides. And now we can take a look at the um, performance results. This is the speed up of the different systems with respect to the baseline. So it's normalized, this uh, execution time is normalized to the execution time of uh, DDR3000. So that's why this is uh, speed up equal to one. And we already obtained some performance improvement from the use of HNC memory in the host system, right? So these are the other two baseline, uh, baselines. And as you can see, the other two baselines perform faster than the DDR3 baseline. That's uh, reasonable, makes sense, and it's good. However, if you uh, compare the difference in peak bandwidth that we have between these uh, two configurations, either DDR3 or HMC, you see that the bandwidth here is more than six times higher than uh, the bandwidth here. What means is that even though this is a compute a memory bound workload that potentially benefits from higher bandwidth, and, uh, and even though we are replacing the DDR memory with an HMC memory that provides in our experiments or in our setup uh, six times more uh, memory bandwidth than DDR3, we are only increasing the, uh, the, the performance minimally, right? Like up to 55% uh, for this HMC OOO configuration. So, however, Tesseract is much more um, efficient as you can see, and on five uh, different graph processing algorithms, these are the performance improvement results that we obtain for the say baseline Tesseract with no prefetchers. And then after including the uh, linear prefetcher and the uh, linear and uh, message trigger prefetcher, we can increase even more the performance uh, from uh, a speed up of nine to a speed up of almost 
14. And we can also take a, a look at the memory bandwidth consumption. So how much of the bandwidth are able these uh, different types of cores that we are using, either out of order or in order cores in the different configurations, how much bandwidth are really uh, are they really using? So, um, so yeah, so you can see that, um, yeah, these are the values for the, ba the three baselines and you can see how the uh, exploited bandwidth uh, or the, the consumed bandwidth is much higher um, in the Tesseract configurations. And, and, and even um, we, can, we can even see that it would be possible to even incorporate more cores to the system if we had a more area to place these cores because uh, these 2.9 terabytes per second is still far from the peak of uh, eight terabytes per second. And by the way, the uh, I mean, it's not only, um, so the, the benefit here is not only coming from uh, the uh, extra bandwidth that Tesseract has, not only from the eight terabytes per second that um, uh, Tesseract um, can uh, obtain or internally, right, uh, in the accelerator. It's, uh, it's also because of the way that the system is built, because of the execution model and the programming model of the system. Uh, here you have some simulation results where uh, we replaced the, so in, in the particular case of the many core um, processor with uh, HMC memory, uh, we have simulated an HMC system that instead of providing 640 gigabytes per second of external bandwidth, it provides eight terabytes per second of external bandwidth. And this of course increases the performance, uh, but not really that much, right? So if you go from 640 gigabytes to eight terabytes, um, we could expect much higher uh, performance improvement, but in the end, it's not that much. It's only like 2.3 times. Um, even if we evaluate the Tesseract with uh, the conventional bandwidth, that it, that's it. Imagine that Tesseract doesn't have eight terabytes of external bandwidth. Imagine that it has six of internal bandwidth, sorry. Imagine that it has only 640 gigabytes per second of internal bandwidth. It's still in that case, Tesseract performs better than the other two configurations, the baseline configurations. And of course, if we um, um, operate Tesseract with its uh, own internal bandwidth, which is um, eight terabytes per second, we see much more uh, speed up, of course. Not no prefetching in this experiment, but I think that you can get what's the actual benefit that uh, we receive from the um, uh, execution model in the accelerator and the uh, programming model that is used. And then we can take a look at the energy uh, consumption because energy is a key motivation as well, not only performance for processing in memory. And here we can see, we can compare the um, energy consumption for the HMC out of order baseline and the uh, Tesseract with prefetching, we see a uh, energy reduction of more than eight times. Um, in order to summarize, let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of Tesseract. Advantages is a specialized graph processing accelerator using PIM, and this is good because graph processing workloads are more and more important these days. Um, pro provides large system, large system performance and energy benefits, as you have just seen in the previous slides, and takes advantage of 3D stacking, takes advantage of this type of processing in memory. Um, and also it's more general than just graph processing. We could even use it uh, for other workloads as well. Or at least with minimal modifications. And then disadvantages is that it changes the system a lot because we need a new accelerator. Now, uh, imagine that you have to replace your GPU because you don't want to compute graphics or anything that is suitable for GPUs and you decide to replace your GPU with a Tesseract accelerator. So in the end, this will require a lot of changes in the system. Or maybe you can you want to have both types of coarse green accelerators in your system, a GPU and a, a Tesseract accelerator. But the fact that this uh, accelerator is a completely um, um, I'd say that separate subsystem in your compute system uh, changes a lot of the things. And for example, we require 
uh, a new programming model. We need a specialized course for graph processing. That's what we have internal to Tesseract. The types of um, uh, prefetchers that we use, for example, are optimized for graph processing. We would need to change these a little bit to make them more general purpose probably. But if we do that, we will also be uh, losing some of the uh, advantages, some of the performance and, and energy uh, benefits uh, of Tesseract itself for graph processing, right? Because the more general purpose you go, the, um, the, the, the least, uh, the, the lower benefits you will receive in terms of performance and energy. And then another disadvantage is cost. Uh, HMC memory is not cheap. Three stack memories are not as cheap as DDR3 memory or DDR4 memory. So that's uh, obviously a, a disadvantage. If, you will, if we want to have a system with this amazing amount of bandwidth, bandwidth we need um, kind of uh, more expensive memories. And then the scalability, and this is an issue that has been targeted by later works as well, building uh, on, on Tesseract. Scalability is limited by off-chip links and graph partitioning. And this is important, right? Because uh, in the beginning we said, okay, you have a huge graph, and then the, 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 the size of each memory stack is not that large. The capacity of each memory stack is not that large. So we need to map the, the graph on multiple stacks. And this makes that from time to time, we have to go to a remote node to, to do some execution. So uh, going through uh, an off-chip link to reach to the remote node increases the latency and increases the energy consumption, of course. So if we keep increasing the size of the accelerator and adding more and more uh, cores, more and more uh, 3D stack um, cubes, we uh, will have an scalability problem as well. Um, there might be ways of alleviating this scalability problem but do it by doing uh, a better and a, and a more, um, yeah, more optimized graph partitioning. And there are also a, uh, actually a couple of works, as I said, that were published after Tesseract and um, use Tesseract as their baseline and optimize the way that the graph is partitioned and mapped uh, onto the hardware. And this is the paper, as I said, presented at ISCA 2015. And uh, I think that this is a good time to take questions if there are any questions. Okay, yeah, so then if there are no questions, then I'm going to uh, continue. We are still in processing near memory. Now we talk about the next way of doing or creating a coarse grain accelerator. And as I said, this is not going to be so much coarse grain because it's not a, a whole separate accelerator that changes a lot of things in the system. In this case, we are going to perform simple function of loading. So we are going to identify some functions or small kernels that can benefit from PIM. And those are the ones that we are going to upload to the uh, memory side. And this is, uh, this is what we did in this um, ASPLOS paper, uh, Google Workloads for Consumer Devices uh, from 2018. I used this paper for motivation yesterday. We are going to talk about this paper more in detail today. Consumer devices are everywhere and uh, energy consumption is a first class course concern in these kind of devices, essentially because they use batteries and batteries have a, a limited duration, as you know. So if, there are, if we, we can figure out ways of saving energy, um, we will uh, definitely benefit a lot the applications running on these consumer devices. And among these applications, we considered uh, a few of them. And here you have four important ones. Um, Google Chrome, it's uh, for sure something that you all know, TensorFlow Mobile, and then uh, the, the, the VP9, which is Google's video codec. We are going to focus on these two in this lecture. But let's uh, talk a little bit more about the motivation. And maybe you even remember this number from yesterday. Key observation number one is that the uh, up, up to 62.7% of the total system energy is spent on data movement when executing these workloads. Potential solution, let's use PIM, let's compute uh, close to data. The challenge is something that I uh, mentioned before is that we have limited area and energy budget. Uh, when you think about one of these 3D stack memories, you already know that there is a logic layer. And in this logic layer, there is some area where we play some DRAM controllers. And then there is some more area that we can use for in order course. But this should still be uh, quite wimpy 
um, in order course or maybe accelerators, but both uh, uh, options are used here in this Google workloads wor uh, work. But in the end, we have limited area. And also because of the fact that the memory is 3D stacked, we can also not spend um, so much energy because otherwise this will uh, cause a lot of thermal dissipation and might end up burning our chips. And that's something that we don't want to happen. So uh, let's use PIM to reduce data movement. And when using PIM to reduce data movement, the second key observation is that a significant fraction of the data movement is coming from simple functions. And uh, that's why the key idea here is design lightweight logic to implement these simple functions in memory. And we um, studied in this work or proposed in this works two different uh, types of logic. In one of the cases, we use a small embedded low power cores. Imagine um, a small ARM core, for example, um, a place in, the, in, the, in, in, in one vault or, or near one Dirman controller in the logic layer. And we may have a few of them in the same stack, and maybe we can have also uh, multiple stacks as we have seen in Tesseract, or instead of having a pin core, we can have a pin accelerator. We have a fixed function accelerator for the simple, specialized for the simple or one of the simple functions that uh, we are going to um, deal with in this work. Uh, as you will see in the results that I'm going to show you later of loading to pin logic reduces energy and improves performance by on average 55.4% and 54.2%. Now let's talk about the workloads. And we are going to start with TensorFlow, TensorFlow Mobile. So TensorFlow Mobile is an application that is used for uh, neural network inference. And one observation is that 53, 57.3% of the inference energy is spent on data movement. And uh, among these data movement, 54.4% of this data movement energy comes from two operations that are pretty simple in reality, as you will see. One of them is packing and unpacking, and the other one is quantization. So let's just start with packing and unpacking. Uh, the idea of packing, packing is a relatively simple procedure that uh, reorders elements of matrices to minimize cache misses during matrix multiplication. So in the end, when we are executing a neural network for inference, in the end, what we are doing is dot product operations, matrix multiplications, right? And you know already how uh, this is implemented, but um, but accessing the data, accessing the data from memory may cause many uh, cache misses. So one thing that the uh, neural network frameworks do, like TensorFlow, for example, is using this packing operation to reorder elements in some way that um, reduces, minimizes the cache misses. So we essentially achieve better locality in later stages of the neural network uh, by reordering uh, the elements of the matrices that we need to use for computation, right? So that's why this packing step uh, is important. But the packing it step itself, um, it, uh, it's uh, really costly in terms of data movement. And as you can see, uh, the data movement of the packing operation accounts for up to 35.3% of the energy of the system. So this simple reorganization is very costly in terms of data movement and in terms of energy. And, but it is like a very simple operation in reality. It's, uh, the, the data reorganization requires very little computation. It's just like reading from here and writing there, right? So um, this can be a suitable operation for processing in memory. The other um, uh, important function that we are targeting here is quantization. Quantization is used to convert 32-bit floating-point integers to 8-bit integers. You probably are familiar with uh, um, how neural networks are working these days. And this quantization step, it's, um, it's pretty common because even uh, by reducing the uh, precision of the operands, we can still achieve good performance because of the robustness of neural networks, right? And this operation, this conversion, this quantization step, uh, it um, takes also a, a large fraction of the energy and the execution time of the inference process. And the majority of, uh, of it, it's coming from the data movement. And uh, it's also pretty simple operation as well. It only requires shift, addition, and multiplication. So now we have identified two operations that are very costly in terms of energy, in terms of data movement, but they 
don't really require. So they require a lot of data movement, but not really so much computation. And that's why they can be suitable for PIM. And that's why in this world, we design uh, different ways of implementing them in PIM. Uh, one of them is uh, using PIM cores, like a more general purpose cores, and the other one is using a specialized accelerators. And these are uh, the results here for both operations, packing and quantization, you can see uh, a large uh, energy, energy reduction from the CPU only baseline implementation to the PIM implementations. And as expected, the uh, accelerators are a little bit more efficient than the general uh, PIM cores. So this is what we achieve respectively. We reduce the energy consumption by 49.1 and 55% uh 55.4% for the pim core and the pim accelerator and in the runtime we see more or less um similar trends um these are uh, here on this side uh, we have uh, the tensor flow and, and 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 we can reduce the so improve the performance by 44 or 55% and now let's talk about the other workload which is uh, google chrome in Google Chrome, well, this is uh, how Chrome renders a web page for uh, I mean, uh, your own uh, learning and uh, a little bit more detail. So we, we, we see a, like a, a full uh, pipeline here that starts with this step of loading and parsing. Then we have the uh, layouting where um, that calculates the visual elements and the position of each object, object in the image. And then we have the pa painting step that is composed by two sub steps. The first one is the rasterization that um, paints the objects and generates a bitmap. And finally, the compositing step that assembles all layers into the uh, final screen image. And um, when, when, when it comes to analyzing the browser, how the, the, the Google Chrome works, um, the key goal here is to satisfy the user experience. And to satisfy the user experience, the browser must provide fast loading of web pages, smooth scrolling of web pages, and quick switching between browser tabs. You have your own experience with using browsers. You know that browsers these days can um, have like many different tabs open with different uh, web pages. And, and, and as, a users, uh, as users, what we know is to have a, a, a seamless experience where we don't have to wait too long for pages to get loaded. We can scroll and move around the pages as much as we want and, 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 and very quickly. And also if we change from one page to another page, we go to another tab, we also want to see the new tab uh, as soon as possible. So that's um, the goal here is to satisfy the user experience. And we are going to focus for now on two important user interactions. The first one is page scrolling. The second one is uh, tab switching. Both include page loading. Let's first start, uh, start with, or let's talk about um, tab switching. What happens during tab switching? So in tab switching, like, you know, uh, in, in Chrome, we have a kind, kind of a multi-process um, and uh, each tab is a separate process. So when we have uh, N tabs open in our Chrome browser, in reality, we have N different processes. Every time that we switch to another tab, there are um, some important operations. One of them is the context switch, and the other one is a load of the new page. So every time that we go from tab one to tab two, there will be some relatively costly operations that um, need to happen and they need to happen as fast as possible. Uh, there are some primary concerns when uh, doing this tab switching. And, um, and the first one is uh, that we want to do these uh, new tab loads uh, as fast as possible. And, and we want them to become interactive as, as, fast, as fast as possible. So we want to be fast, uh, but we also have to uh, take care of the amount of memory consumption. And the point is that every time that you have an inactive tab, uh, you have to do something with it. You don't want to keep it in DRAM, right? Because it's not being used. So what uh, uh, Google Chrome actually does is that Google compresses these tabs, these pages, and stores them in a compressed manner in one special area of, of uh, DRAM that is called setram. And, uh, and whenever uh, the user wants to switch to a new tab, to another tab that is uh, in setram and it's, uh, it's compressed, we need to decompress the tab and then uh, bring it to the CPU. 
So uh, we did here a data movement study to during tab switching to um, measure how much, what's the amount of uh, data movement that takes place during tab switching. And to, to do so, we emulate a user switching through 50 tabs. And there are two key observations from this analysis. The first one is that the compression and decompression take 18%, 18.1% of the total system energy. And the second one is that uh, for 50 tabs, these 50 tabs with um, different web pages, of course, um, it was measured a, a large amount of data movement. Almost 20 gigabytes of data were moved between uh, CPU and, and ZRAM. So we should try to deal with these two. We want to be fast and we want to reduce the um, uh, memory footprint as much as possible and PIM can help uh, to do so. In the baseline implementation with a CPU only implementation, uh, this is more or less what happens when we do tab switching. We swap out, we swap out M pages, assuming that these M pages are not being used. Um, so they are uncompressed pages in memory. So we need to read the pages, compress them on the CPU and then write them back to memory, to the set RAM, and then continue doing other tasks. In the PIM case, well, there is a high data movement here, as you can see. In the PIM case, uh, when we want to swap out pages, we offload this compression to the PIM side. So we read the uncompressed pages um, and in the, in the compute elements, in the compute units on the memory side, we compress them and then we store them. And uh, whatever, so there is no off chip data movement in that case and whatever other tasks that the CPU needs to do can start right after these uh, swap out M pages or maybe later that will depend and we can have um, uh, the CPU in an idle state and, uh, and also saving energy because it's an, in an idle state. So a pin core and a peer and accelerator are feasible to implement in memory compression and decompression um, in this case. Okay, so wrapping up, uh, a large amount of data movement happens during tab switching as Chrome attempts to compress and decompress tabs. Both functions can benefit from uh, processing in memory and can be implemented using PIM logic. And, uh, and actually, if you want to uh, take a look at the results, you can uh, go back to this slide. Here we have for Chrome browser, compression and decompression. Uh, here you can see uh, the energy uh, savings that are uh, yeah, in the same order of magnitude that, as the energy savings that we have seen before for um, TensorFlow and also um, energy, so uh, performance improvements for compression and decompression also um, in the same order of magnitude, as I said. Okay, um, please let me know if there are any questions at this point, I'm going to Go back to where we were. Okay. Uh, no questions in the lecture room or or in YouTube. Okay, that's fine. So then let's continue with the uh, a few more examples. Uh, this idea of uh, of loading simple functions to the PIM side is not only applicable to CPU as in this uh, or, or mobile CPUs as in this uh, Google workloads paper that I have just presented. They can also, this is also a um, um, suitable technique for other types of uh, processors, like for example, uh, GPUs, right? And that's uh, something that our group also studied uh, with uh, like um, um, this, uh, Tom proposal, transparent of loading and mapping uh, of computation for GPUs, where we have a main GPU and this main GPU is connected to memory stacks. This is already something that happens in, in real GPUs these days because uh, they are the, the main GPU is connected to different stacks of HVM2 memory. Um, and, uh, but in this case, we are, um, uh, we are um, providing these uh, memory stacks with the uh, ability of computing as well, because in the logic layer, we play some small GPU cores. These are actually a smaller GPU cores and the ones that are used in the main GPU, but they still they are good for 
um, like um, uh, more memory bound uh, operations, right? And in the Tom paper, actually, this is something that we are going to mention later as well. In the Tom paper, uh, we provide a way of identifying what parts of a GPU kernel are suitable for execution in the logic layer. And uh, after having identified them, the computation can be offloaded to the memory side. So that's, um, as I said, something that uh, you can find in this uh, Tom paper, the same idea of offloading uh, a small, a simple functions to the PIM side can also be applied to GPUs. And this is another um, um, example of uh, processing in memory uh, GPU architecture. In this case, the um, granularity of the of loading, it's a little bit coarser than in the Tom paper because here we offload uh, entire kernels that are previously identified as memory bound or compute bound. I, for sure, uh, two very uh, interesting readings. And there are more use cases of um, like simple operations being executed or simple functions being executed near memory. This is a proposal for accelerating point and pointer chasing uh, using processing in memory and also ways of accelerating cache misses in this case with a memory controller that has some certain near data processing capabilities, right? And it can, um, uh, uh, predict cache misses and bring the data uh, to the cache hierarchy even earlier. So it's also some sort of processing near memory, as you can see. And this is another uh, similar proposal, the continu continuous run ahead uh, paper. And it's not only that, right? So we, we also uh, have produced some interesting works where we accelerate other types of important applications. For example, in this Nero paper, uh, it's a uh, near memory processing for FPGAs targeting uh, an important application, weather prediction modeling, or this Genasen paper also in the category of processing near memory, uh, in this case, uh, processing in memory for uh, genome sequence analysis. Or this other one, uh, accelerating time series analysis, also published last year also a near data processing accelerator, as you see. Okay, so let's say that we are done with the first part, coarse grain acceleration, second, second part, uh, providing uh, minimal processing in memory support. Now assume that we don't want to change the system very much. We just want to identify simple instructions that can benefit from processing in memory because they are um, inherently memory bound and they always cause uh, or very frequently cause uh, cache misses in a baseline system. So after having identified them, we can say, okay, let's offload the computation of this simple instruction to the memory side. Because the good thing of this is that it's going to enable the integration of processing in memory with minimal changes to the system and to the uh, programming model. And this is the PIM enabled paper, PIM enabled instructions paper that was also presented at ISCA 2015. So there are some uh, important ideas here that we need to discuss. First of all, the goal is to develop mechanisms to get the most out of near data processing with minimal cost, minimal changes to the system, and no changes to the programming model. Uh, uh, key idea number one is to expose each processing in memory operation as a processor instruction and uh, that operates on a single cache block. So from the processor point of view, each processing in memory instruction is a processor instruction that is identified, detected by the processor and then offloaded to the memory side. And it's going to operate on a single cache block. This is an important restriction to make things simpler and to make the integration simpler, but um, yeah, even though it's a restriction, it's not such a surprising restriction. There are already in the systems, in, in, in current computing systems, uh, operations that uh, are restricted to a, a single cache block. Is a, a single cache block is the example of uh, the atomic operations in CPUs and GPUs, for example. So this is more or less the uh, shape, the, the syntax of one of these uh, um, uh, PIM enable instructions. We are going to see some uh, code next. And the good thing of this approach is that it doesn't require any changes on the, on the way that the, uh, the program is executed on the host CPU or in the programming model or the virtual memory system. Minimal changes to cache coherence. You can find the details in the, in the paper about how this is implemented and uh, no there's no need to worry about 
uh, data mapping because um, each processing unit, each uh, uh, processing element that executes PEI instructions near the memory operates on a single cache block. And it, because it operates on a single cache block, this cache block is going to reside in the same memory module, right? So we don't need to worry about, oh, now we have to go to get some data that is residing on another stack or something like that, similar to what we had to do in Tessera, right? So this is much simpler because of this restriction of operating on a single cache line. And then the second key idea is to uh, be smart in the of loading decisions in the scheduling, because in sometimes and depending on the algorithms as well, the data might be residing in memory, which is was what we expect in in in. in many, many cases, but maybe not all the cases, because depending on the algorithm, it might turn out that some of the data that you need to operate on using the PEI instructions might already reside in the cache hierarchy because, because the, 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 the processor has already uh, worked with uh, this data and the data is residing uh, in the cache. So in those cases, we want to do some sort of intelligent scheduling, the, um, uh, um, uh, figure out where the data, uh, the target date, targeted data resides, either in the cache hierarchy or in memory, and based on that, make the decision on whether of loading or not of loading. Okay, and this is like uh, a little bit of motivation. What happens in a conventional architecture? Recall the page rank algorithm in page rank. Uh, we have uh, the vertices of the graph and then we go successor by successor of each vertex and we update uh, the rank value. So if we, if we want to uh, compute this on a host processor, we need to go to memory to read the, to read the successor node, the, the, the next rank value. And this is bringing one whole uh, cache line of 64 bytes. And then after computing, we will have to write back the value uh, that they update the value to memory, right? And the problem with this is that we are reading uh, 64 bytes from memory and we are writing 64 bytes to memory. Um, if we uh, provide a simple mechanism as PEI, we can save a lot of energy and also a lot of time by uh, directly offloading the computation to the memory side. In, a, in this case, we don't need to read the next rank value. We, we don't need to read um, uh, the, the, the successor node. We just need to copy, to move the value that we have to add to this next rank from the host processor to the memory, then perform the computation in memory. And we would be saving a lot of data movement, as you can see, from 128 bytes that have been moved in the previous slide, only eight bytes moved in this slide. And to do so, we require this PIM enable instruction. In the end is one addition, as we saw uh, in the previous code, but uh, here it has a, a particular syntax to identify it, to, to identify it as uh, a PIM enable instruction. And here we can already see uh, some uh, uh, interesting results. This is a speed up for different graphs uh, that uh, go from graphs, well, let's say relatively small graphs to much larger graphs. So these graphs are sorted here in the X axis uh, by the number of vertices. So more vertices to the right. What we see is that the speed up increases when we have enough number of vertices in our graph. And the reason is that if something is uh, one graph is pretty small, it's pretty likely that the graph uh, feeds or, or most of the graph fits in the cache hierarchy of the CPU. And in that case of loading to process to, to, to PIM doesn't really make so much sense, right? We can see uh, more uh, results. So in this case, reduce memory bandwidth because we are doing uh, in-memory computation. In this case, caching is very effective. Okay, let's uh, uh, continue talking about the uh, example. Uh, this example, this um, this is uh, the, the example code. This was for page rank, and here what we are doing is only a, a PIM add instruction. Here you can see a a list of the uh, uh, PIM enable operations or PIM uh, operations that are uh, proposed by this work. We have different things like uh, increment, minimum, floating point addition, hash table probing. Uh, histogram being indexed, calculation of Euclidean distance or calculation of dot product uh, happening inside memory um, with the PEI. These are just some examples for sure. If you work on this, you could identify uh, even more and, and, and use them for your specific applications. Um, these 
beam enable instructions are executed either in memory or the processor. Recall that I mentioned the key idea of doing a dynamic intelligent offloading depending on where the data resides. Uh, this proposal is cache coherent, virtually addressed, and uh, it's atomic uh, between different PIs, but it's not atomic with normal instructions. And what is what this means? Well, what this means is that um, when the CPU, when a, a host processor is executing this code here, at some point it will find this PIM enable instruction. Because it finds this PIM enable instruction and identifies it, it knows that the CPU knows, or well, after making the scheduling decision, we may end up offloading the computation of this instruction to the memory side, right? But after that, we don't want the CPU to just wait for the memory side to terminate, right? Because if we are doing that, then we are not saving that much. So we want the CPU to continue executing more instructions if it has something to compute. But at some point, the CPU wants to or needs to make sure that this addition has been already uh, has already been executed. And to do so, we need some sort of barrier or some sort of fence that tells the CPU that tells the host processor that the uh, processing in memory operation finished, right? So, and that's why we need to um, use these P fences. Okay, so key to practicality is uh, something that I already mentioned is the restriction of operating on a single cache block. And even though this is a restriction, it facilitates things a lot. It has uh, clear benefits in terms of localization, recall. What I told you before, you offload a PEI to the memory side. And the good thing is that this unit, this processing element that executes the PEI knows that only needs to access one cache block that resides in the same memory module or in the same vault. It doesn't need to go to a remote memory module. Then uh, another benefit is uh, interoperability with uh, easier support for cache coherence and virtual memory, the fact that we are using a single cache line means that we can do the virtual memory address translation on the host side and then uh, operate on uh, physical memories on, on the memory side. And then uh, we also have simplified locality monitoring. We are going to have in the CPU, near the CPU, near the cache hierarchy, a locality monitor, which is this unit that every time that a PEI instruction needs to be ex executed, checks where the cache line resides. The, whether this cache line is in the cache hierarchy or the cache line is in the memory side, and based on that, make the uh, offloading decision. And this is simplified thanks, thanks to the fact that if we are using a single cache block. If we were using more, the decision would be more complex, right? If you're using, I could say, four cache blocks and um, two of them are in the cache hierarchy and the other two are in memory, now what do you do? So in this case, because it's only a single cache block, it's much easier to make the decision, right? And here you can see. Uh, the methodology that uh, has been used in this paper, uh, different uh, workloads that were uh, evaluated from graph processing, data analytics, but also machine learning or uh, data mining, configuration of the baseline system, uh, simulator, and here are some uh, summary results in terms of performance improvement and energy reduction. As you see, the performance improvement and the energy reduction is not as high as in, uh, for example, the Tesseract work, but that's because here we are offloading uh, minimal computation to the memory side. So we cannot expect uh, much more than that. And here, yeah, you can uh, find more, um, yeah, actually the, the, the actual workloads that were used, like for example, these graph processing workloads, like these um, average th teenage follower or BFS or page rank, et cetera, or here in data analytics, Hasio in histogram, or in machine learning, the machine learning workloads. And, and you can see here some of the results, these are the, say, better results because these are for large inputs. And when we have large inputs, this means that it's uh, more frequent that we have to go to memory for the execution. So the workload itself turns to be uh, more memory bound. And this means that it can benefit more from processing in memory. And here you see for the different applications, um, the um, performance improvement uh, obtained by the PIM only solution where we always offload to PIM or the quality aware solution where we do the intelligent scheduling. And this, we see also how the normalized amount of, of chip transfer um, 
so the, the amount of, of chip transfer of, of data movement gets reduced uh, in most of the applications from the host only implementation to the beam only or the locality aware. Uh, but then if we go, if we take a look at the small inputs, uh, it's uh, what we showed already in the beginning, right? There is not benefit in all of the cases because um, not benefit from PIM in all of the cases because the inputs are small and they probably fit in the cache hierarchy. That's why the locality aware uh, unit is um, of loading is uh, so important in these cases. And here you can see also the results for the normalized amount of, of chip transfer. And these are results for uh, median inputs, uh, medium size inputs where, well, it, they are kind of halfway between the small and large inputs. So we uh, can see uh, higher uh, performance improvements, but also um, the, the locality aware scheduling uh, might, so in general produces uh, significantly better results. And here, um, some energy consumption results uh, also, in line with the results, the performance results that we have seen for a small, medium, and large uh, data sets, locality aware is uh, definitely the best um, thing to do in all of the cases. Advantages and disadvantages of PI. Advantages is simple and low cost approach to processing in memory, no changes uh, to the programming model uh, are required or to virtual memory. Uh, we have the possibility of dynamically deciding when to offload or not offload, uh, but then there are also some disadvantages. First of all, it doesn't take full advantage of the PIM potential because we are only executing individual instructions. It's very simple computation that is being offloaded, and if we compare to the previous uh, proposal, we see that the um, energy savings and the um, uh, improved performance uh, is not as high as in, in, in previous proposals like Tesseract. Uh, one reason is that the single cash block uh, restriction. And you can find many more details in the paper. I'm pretty sure that this will be uh, a recommended paper. Okay, yeah, um, the other example is the Tom paper. I talked about the Tom paper already and also about this one, accelerate independent cash misses, uh, continuous run ahead. And um, and there are, um, yeah, actually more things to do here. Uh, yeah, so the reason why we uh, talk again here about the uh, transparent offloading and, and mapping is because in this work, uh, we also target some of the uh, say issues that are necessary to target to enable processing in memory, such as, for example, uh, the data mapping and the and the uh, code mapping as well. Right, uh, that's um, I think we have also one a slide later about that uh, of loading critical code, of loading of prefetch mechanisms. So these are different processing in memory techniques that in some of the cases are more targeted to some of the actions that the system uh, needs to perform, such as, for example, prefetching operations. And then uh, coherent support. This is a lazy pin paper. We are going to talk about these and this one uh, in the next slides. But in the end, um, the challenge and opportunity for the future in these processing near memory systems and in processing in memory in general is uh, to fundamentally, uh, fundamentally build um, uh, energy efficient and data centric computing architectures and high performance uh, computing architectures create computing architectures with minimal data movement and this way make processing in memory a, a truly successful trend. I think um, it might be a good time to uh, take questions um, and if there are no questions we can take a break probably or we can take the break after the, after the questions. I was wondering, how does the um, BIM manage when, like, if you have a multi-core system that has two applications running at once and each makes a request to, like, process in memory, and then how is that synchronized with the PFENCE? Like, how does it know which instruction belongs to which application and when to say, yeah, I'm done, or could you have, like, one app sending all their things, and the other one's request was done for a while, but it never, like, tells it because it's still running things? Well, uh, that's uh, actually a very good question, and I would say that this is an active, uh, that can be an active field of research. Um, if we uh, restrict 
ourselves to the, uh, the, the case of the PIM-enabled instructions, which is where I have talked about uh, the PFENS operation. Uh, the, the, the system itself should provide a way of, um, of uh, so the, 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 the proposal itself uh, provides a way of notifying the right core or the right thread uh, when a P fence comes, right? In the end, you may have multiple threads of execution in the same program, and um, and and these different threads are offloading uh, PIM enabled instructions to the memory side, and then at some point they will have to um, confirm that something has been executed. And this is something that happens because the processing in memory unit that is called uh, PCU, if I if I recall correctly, the the, the uh, compute unit near the memory notifies the core and notifies the corresponding thread when the um, computation uh, has has been completed. So in that case, it's uh, relatively simple. But then uh, there may be other cases that would require more discussion and more um, studies and, 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 and new research proposals in the way that um, we uh, um, so in, in the way that we design mechanisms to share the PIM, the processing in memory capabilities with multiple, not only threads of execution, but also processes or programs, right? And, uh, and um, so here, there may be different ways of doing it. And, uh, and I, I usually like to uh, compare the evolution of processing in memory of the research and also the uh, current systems that uh, already start uh, existing, I like usually to compare it with uh, the evolution of GPUs. Uh, when GPU programming, the general purpose GPU programming or GPU computing started more than 10 years ago, um, it wasn't possible to have more than two process, more than one process uh, taking advantage of the GPU, using the GPU at a certain point, right? Uh, after that, um, the um, vendors started to provide ways and the programming models started to provide ways of partitioning in some way, either temporal or spatial, uh, partitioning of the GPU among different processes that, that can execute concurrently or maybe if not concurrently in time slices, let's say, right? And something similar is um, definitely necessary in PIN systems as well. If I if I tell you about uh, real systems, for example, AppMem, and this is something that uh, we will mention in our next lecture, in AppMem, we have uh, such a large amount of DRAM processing units or uh, PIM cores that the uh, decision uh, that AppMem folks made is that each individual DPU can only be used by one process. So if you have two processes running on your system, each of them can allocate a certain number of DPUs. If you have, let's say 2000 DPUs in your system, one of them may be using uh, 1200 uh, DPUs while the other one will be using 800 DPUs, right? And in that case, there is no problem in uh, how to coordinate the uh, concurrent access to the same uh, processing in memory cores, right? Because we are simply, um, dividing them in two groups and assigning them to different processes. So that's one potential way of doing it. And, and I don't think it's a crazy way of doing it because normally we will have uh, processing in memory systems with multiple cores conforming some sort of distributing, distributed system, right? And, and in, that, in those cases, um, it might make sense to do so. But in other cases, it might make sense to, to try different ways. I'm, personally not aware of any works that have already explore, explore this idea of, uh, uh, of having multiple processes of loading computation to the pin side and orchestrating the way that the different processes um, use the, the different cores. So for sure, this can be a, a good uh, field of research. And if uh, you or anyone else is interested in discussing about this, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that well, I would be glad and I'm pretty sure that other people in the group would be glad as well uh, about discussing uh, ideas in this direction. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that was good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? 
Okay, so uh, I think we can uh, come back at uh, um, 2.55, so five minutes before 3 p.m. and uh, we can continue from here. In the meantime, you can think about what we covered and, and prepare more questions for later.
Hello. Uh, we will continue in two minutes. But meanwhile, if there are any questions uh, from students in the lecture room or anywhere else, please ask. Yeah, I hope everything is clear, or most of it, it's most of it is clear. Uh, good thing is that uh, you will have some of these papers as required readings or optional readings in your homework, and uh, and you will analyze them, and and this way you can um, even learn more about each of them. By the way, we also have a processing in memory course that uh, we started teaching like one year ago. This year, uh, we are, um, yeah, we have, let's say, improved the format of this course by uh, including lectures, uh, short lectures every week. Um, and right now, so we have taught three lectures. The first two, no, the first one, we covered an introduction to uh, processing in memory, including some of the uh, works that. Uh, I'm discussing today and I discussed yesterday as well. And then, um, yeah, we continue, we have continued with some lectures uh, focused on the AppMemP architecture and, and we will continue with more with uh, programming processing in memory systems and, and also analysis of other processing in memory systems as well. Okay, yeah, I think it's uh, time to continue. And um, uh, yeah, um, uh, we can, uh, very quickly summarize what we have seen so far in processing in memory. There are two main directions. The first one we call it processing is in memory, and it consists of computing with the memory cells themselves, uh, either uh, DRAM memory or uh, non volatile memories, uh, as we saw yesterday. Today, we have covered uh, processing near memory approaches, and um, in particular, we have focused on three. Uh, main works that use uh, uh, three stack memory uh, to implement processing near memory, placing compute elements either in order cores or either uh, specialized accelerators in the logic layer of a three stack memory. But as I said as well, this is not the only form of processing in memory. And we have even mentioned some uh, other examples that uh, are as well processing near memory because they uh, place the computation, for example, near the memory controller or in an FPGA uh, connected to a, to a HVM stack using a silicon interpoiser. So there might be different ways of processing near memory. But now what we are are going to talk is about what more things need to be done to enable the adoption of processing in memory. So far, what we have seen is like the basic techniques that can enable processing in memory, right? Like the, 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 the techniques that enable you to have compute capability in memory, either using the memory cells or either using accelerators or small cores near the memory, right? So that's what we have seen. It's obviously the first thing that we need to consider. But after that, we need to integrate the processing in memory system or the processing in memory capabilities into the system. And to do so, uh, we need to uh, work a little bit more. And there are still, uh, some open questions um, in, 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 in this topic, in processing in memory, and some of the other questions are starting to get answered by uh, all research and research from other groups as well. So how to enable the adoption of processing in memory? Barriers for, or some of the barriers for adoption of processing in memory are these five that you can find here. First, uh, functionality of and applications and software for PIM. So identifying what's the type of computation, what's the right computation that we have to do near the memory and what applications and software can benefit from these. Identify the applications as well that can benefit from these. We have uh, done already a little bit of uh, work in this direction and I'm going to mention uh, soon one of our works. Then 
ease of programming. Uh, you have seen that you know these different approaches have different ways of dealing with programming. We have something pretty simple as PEI, which is um, doesn't require any changes in programming. It's just replacing one instruction with another instruction like this uh, PIM add that we have using our examples. In other cases, we need much more a complex and deep changes to the, the way that we program as in a course ring accelerators. Then we need uh, system support. Uh, we need to deal with memory coherence and we need to deal with virtual memory. As you know, from the CPU perspective and the, from the programmer's pers perspective, uh, we use a virtual memory of um, infinite size, but the reality is that there is a, a physical memory of a certain size. That's why we use, um, um, so in order to uh, allow us to do memory over subscription, among other uses, we use virtual memory systems that now if you are computing in memory and not computing in the processor, how do you deal with uh, virtual memory, right? I gave you the example of, um, I gave you the example in PEI because it's operating on a single cache line. It's as simple as uh, doing the virtual to physical memory translation in the, in the CPU before offloading the computation to PIM. In other cases, like for example, coarse grain accelerators like uh, Tesseract or even the AppMem PIM architecture, they don't use the virtual memory, they directly work on physical memory, but that's because we offload the whole computation to the to the memory side and then supposedly there are they are, there are um, enough uh, security guarantees to to uh, work with um, um, with the physical memory directly. In other cases we uh, I mean also for system integration we have to uh, deal with um, um, memory coherence as well. The fact that we have processors in different system in different places, we have processor, we have the, the host or main processor, we have um, maybe small processor or accelerators uh, in the memory side, and and these small processor accelerators may have their own small caches, right? And and if they are operating using these caches, uh, they might be uh, updating cache lines. These cache lines will get dirty in the in the um, cache of the uh, processing in memory. Uh, cores and uh, if the CPU requests something needs to access some of these data that is dirty in one of these caches, we will have to enable some sort of memory coherence support for the CPU in this case to access the most uh, up-to-date value um, in these cache lines. But then there are more things, right? Like runtime and compilation systems for adaptive scheduling, data mapping, uh, sharing, uh, access sharing and, um, and control. Uh, we have already uh, mentioned some of these, like uh, the need for intelligent scheduling in, in for example, the PEI paper. Uh, we, I, I have also very quickly mentioned the, uh, the, the issues with uh, data mapping, doing the optimal data mapping um, in Tesseract or in the TOM paper and so on. But as I said, there are still uh, many things to uh, solve in this um, topic as well. And finally, infrastructures to assess benefits and feasibility. In the end, um, when we start a new uh, field of research as well, one of the things that we have to start creating is the tools to do this research, right? And, um, and these are simulators or these are benchmark suites or these are uh, performance or energy models to, to evaluate our, our proposals. All of these need to be developed from scratch, essentially. Um, some of them are, are already available because they are byproducts of uh, some of the research proposals, either, either from, our, from us or from, from other people, but in the end, there is still a lot to do in this direction. And all of these uh, challenges, all of these barriers can be solved with a change of mindset. A change of mindset that uh, assumes that we uh, have to revisit the entire computing stack from the algorithms to the devices and, um, and go step by step solving each of these um, challenges. And if you want to go deeper into the different challenges, uh, discuss, discuss, interesting discussions about these challenges, uh, I would recommend you this uh, book chapter that I have recommended you uh, also uh, yesterday. And this is another version of it, shorter one, um, uh, that um, yeah was published in the Micro Journal or this other one that was published in the IBM Journal of Research and Development. This is more um, um, focused on, um, on, on the workloads and 
work characterization and programming, but it's uh, more or less along the lines of the previous works as well. And uh, yeah, among the challenges that I was mentioned, one key challenge is code mapping, right? So where do we have to execute and where do we have to place the code and to place the data? And this is something that the uh, Tom paper deals with. Why does the Tom paper needs to, uh, need to deal with uh, this code mapping? Because in the end, uh, it, yeah, it assumes that the main GPU is connected to multiple, several, uh, processing in memory, uh, 3D stack memory, where each of them has uh, some SMs or some uh, GPU cores in the in the logic layer. And uh, if we are going to offload some computation to uh, each of these stacks here, the code should also reside near the uh, SMs or the, near the GPU cores in the logic layer. And some and similar thing is what we have to do for uh, data mapping. This doesn't mean that one core in this logic layer cannot access data in this stack. There are ways of doing that and there are ways uh, enabled in the tone paper. But of course, uh, this core inside this logic layer is going to enjoy much higher bandwidth if it accesses only data that resides in the layers of this 3D stack memory rather than having to go to uh, some other uh, 3D stack memory that is uh, far away, right? So uh, coming up with intelligent ways of uh, or smart ways and efficient ways of doing code and data mapping is uh, very important. And this is the reference of the paper. This is the other uh, the important uh, GPU paper, processing in memory paper for GPUs. Uh, and, and this one is more, um, focus on uh, scheduling techniques. So here, I, I mentioned this before here, the, the idea is identifying GPU kernels that are more memory bound than others. And based on that, uh, organize and orchestrate all the computation in either the main GPU cores or the GPU cores near the memory. And um, um, related to how to schedule code as well, these uh, accelerating data dependent cache misses with the enhanced memory controller, or this uh, continuous uh, run ahead that I also mentioned before. One more challenge uh, that I mentioned in the previous slide is maintaining memory coherence. As I said, now we have uh, two different processors or more than two different processors that are um, operating on data in the same application. Um, one of them might be up, uh, updating some values right into memory, um, and, and having a dirty cache lying in, in, in its own private caches. And then uh, the other one uh, needs to access this data. So we need to provide the system with a protocol, with a mechanism to uh, deal with this memory coherence. And then to make sure that every time that a processor, either a host processor or a PIM processor needs to access data from memory, this data will be the most updated. Uh, it will receive the most updated copy, uh, the most up-to-date copy copy of uh, the data. And but implementing traditional coherence mechanisms as the ones that we typically use in multi-core systems, for example, or in uh, in other um, uh, types of accelerators, or for example, GPUs, might be extremely costly compared to the. Uh, might, might, might be extremely costly and burden the ideal performance and energy savings of processing in memory a lot. And this is actually, these are actually some um, interesting results that are from one of our papers, uh, Lazy Pim, that proposes a way of maintaining the coherence between the CPU and the PIM cores. And, uh, and here, the very, the very first thing that we can see is that when uh, employing traditional coherent mechanisms such as fine grain, uh, fine grain uh, coherence or coarse grain coherence or no uh, caching at all, because that's also a way of, of doing uh, or mant maintaining coherence, right? If we don't do, uh, if we don't cache anything that is updated by the, um, by the PIM core, the CPU will always read an updated copy of the data from memory. So that's uh, also uh, one way. Um, so what we see is that these three mechanisms burden the performance quite a bit. And, uh, and uh, compared to the uh, execution on CPU only with this is this uh, black bar, uh, we see that we 
either achieve like very, very small performance improvement when using fine grain multi-threading. I think that uh, here the messy protocol was used um, and uh, for coarse graying or, or no catching, it's uh, even worse, right? So uh, actually no benefit from process processing in memory if we are employing coarse grain cache coherence or uh, no cache coherence at all. At, at all. So uh, in this work, uh, we uh, propose one way of maintaining coherence, an optimistic way of maintaining coherence between the memory side and the processor side. And this way, as we will see, is pretty close to the ideal. Um, so let's uh, talk about it. This plot comes from the, um, in, let's say, the, the first publication um, uh, in this topic, which is um, a lazy ping proposal published in uh, Carl Journal. And uh, sometime later, uh, Amirali published this um, ISCA paper, uh, the CONDA, Efficient Cash Coherent Support for Near Data Accelerators. So let's talk uh, briefly about uh, CONDA and let's understand how cash coherence uh, might be, can be maintained in systems with CPUs and near data accelerators or near data cores. When I, I, I'm, I'm talking here about near data, but this is processing in memory and, and we can, uh, and I will use both terms interchangeably. So specialized accelerators are everywhere. And uh, now we have also accelerators in the logic layer of three stack memories, or we have uh, similar ways of doing near data processing or processing near memory. Um, and it's necessary to maintain the coherence because there is a, a large cost of, of chip communication. Now we have processors here. We have uh, also compute units there and they are uh, updating um, data here and there. And that generates a lot of, uh, of chip data movement. Um, and uh, even if we have uh, PIM units, we want to avoid um, more data movement than the necessary because um, as we have seen um, in the previous motivation results, it's impractical to use traditional coherence uh, protocols. So there are uh, three key observations here. Um, the coherence mechanisms that traditional coherent coherence mechanisms eliminate a, sin a significant portion of the NDA's benefits we actually have seen only a little bit of performance improvement for the high, fine grain memory coherence, while the other two are even worse than using the CPU only. Uh, the majority of, of chief coherence traffic is generated by these mechanisms and is unnecessary. And more, much of this um, off chip traffic can be eliminated um, if the coherence mechanism has an insight into the memory access. If the coherence mechanism is, let's say, beam aware. So uh, in this work, we assume an optimistic approach to coherence uh, to address the challenges related to NDA coherence. Uh, first of all, gain insights before any coherence check happens. Second, perform only the necessary coherence requests. And, uh, and these, uh, by, by um, exploiting these two key ideas, we can propose CONDA, a mechanism that uses optimistic NDA execution to avoid unnecessary coherent traffic. So in CONDA, what we essentially do is um, we have both uh, the, the, the CPU threads executing on the CPU. We have the NDA accelerators executing certain parts of the computation of the program, maybe in some cases more coarse grain, in some other cases uh, more fine grain, uh, at some point, the CPU offloads computation, offloads an NDA kernel to the NDA side, and, um, and, and we start with the execution on the NDA side. And now the problem here is that these two might be computing at the same time. There will be models, there will be cases where the CPU simply stops and wait for the NDA accelerator to continue the execution. There will be other cases where the uh, CPU continues computing something else, maybe operating on the same data structures or operating on different data structures. The thing is that if this concurrent execution happens, then we need to uh, enable the memory coherence in some way. If there are no, um, um, so in, 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 in our assumption with the optimistic execution, there is no coherence request during this time, but at the end of the execution of the kernel on the NDA accelerator, it generates a signature 
same as the other site generates a signature. And these signatures are compared. And if, uh, if the, um, any of uh, both sites have updated or, or have worked with data that was also uh, used by the other side, uh, we need to um, um, do this uh, coherence resolution and uh, figure out whether we can just commit and terminate the execution on the NDA accelerator, or we need to re-execute. So again, the idea is the CPU threads, the thread is executing at some point, it offloads uh, some computation to the NDA, to the, to the uh, processing in memory accelerator or processing in memory co uh, core. At that time, while the MB NDA accelerator is computing, the CPU might be computing um, other stuff, maybe on the same data structure or different data structures. And we assume an optimistic execution. We don't care about coherence at that point. We assume that everything is going to work well. At the end of the execution, at the end of the NDA kernel, we check what has really been updated. And if it turns out that both the CPU and the NDA accelerator of our work and updated the same cache line, then we cannot continue the execution as such. We cannot commit the execution of the kernel. So we need to update the values on the memory side and re-execute. So it's optimistic in the way that it assumes that the CPU and the NDA accelerator, because they in principle are, um, are being used by the program for different purposes. Uh, the assumption here is that they are not going to touch the same data. And after that, we check whether they touch the same data or not. And if they uh, didn't do it, they didn't touch the same data, then we can commit, we can um, assume that the NDA terminate and the NDA kernel terminates. If not, we have to update the data in memory and re-execute. And that's uh, essentially the key idea behind the, or the key mechanism behind the CONDA paper. Um, by doing so, CONDA uh, is uh, within 10% and 4.4% the performance and energy of an ideal NDA coherence mechanism. So much closer to the ideal than others, uh, than other uh, uh, memory coherence protocols as we have seen in previous slides. And this is the yeah, title of the CONDA paper. And, and here you can find a, a link to the paper if you want to uh, take a closer look at this uh, proposal. Okay, uh, but yeah, memory coherence is not the only thing that, uh, okay, there is one question. Okay, a question about Conda. Aren't, aren't we still limited by the CPU's commit buffer reorder buffer? Uh, that is the number of instructions then that the uh, CPU can finish without execution, without committing. Um, I think that this is a, a different limitation that affects only the execution on the, on the CPU core. It has, I think, yeah, I think it has nothing to do with the memory side. Why is that? Because um, the CPU, okay, yeah, the, the CPU uh, has a reorder buffer and needs to uh, commit instructions when they are um, uh, completed in the CPU pipeline, right? And that's completely independent of what happens on the memory side. So, and, uh, but in the end, uh, the fact that this number is limited is the same as, if you don't have an out of order CPU, you have an in order CPU and start uh, issuing instructions onto the pipeline. When the pipeline is full, you have to start waiting until some other instructions commit or terminate and start executing new instructions. In the meantime, the NDA accelerator can be working on something uh, completely different. In the end, um, the CPU at some point will detect a call, a call to the um, um, function that executes on the memory side, like the, the pin kernel, for example, and that's a um, that's, um, different operation that has nothing to do with the uh, execution and the pipeline of the CPU. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, so 
uh, I, I was talking about coherence, other things that need to be enabled to, um, to integrate uh, processing in memory into the system and to, and to make it even more usable, right? Not only for certain applications, but uh, more complex applications as well. And, um, and, and, and one of the things that we also need to enable in, 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 in uh, processing in memory systems, it's uh, efficient synchronization support uh, for near data processing architectures. We will talk, as I said before, we will talk about the uh, real world processing in memory architecture next week, and you will see that uh, this processing in memory proposal can potentially benefit, or this processing in memory architecture, real processing in memory architecture can potentially benefit from synchronization mechanisms as the one proposed in this um, synchron paper that uh, we presented at HPCA this year. Let's uh, very quickly talk about how um, synchronization can be implemented. Synchronization among different um, processing in memory cores can be implemented um, uh, using synchron. Okay, so uh, the problem is that the synchronization support is challenging for uh, near data processing systems because prior schemes are not suitable or efficient for uh, near data processing systems. And uh, we propose Synchron, which is the first end-to-end -end synchronization solution for NDP architectures. And here you can see some results, like um, 9.5 and 6.2% far from the ideal uh, processing in memory with zero overhead synchronization, right? So very close uh, to the idea as well in this case. Synchronization is necessary because it's used in many different applications. As you can see here, graph, graph analytics, for example, are uh, important ones in the, for example, single source, shortest path algorithm. We need to uh, update distance values for certain uh, vertices that are uh, at, at, at a certain distance from a uh, a source node that where, where we, or source vertex uh, where we start executing the single source shortest path algorithm. And, um, and we may have multiple threads or multiple pin cores operating on the same algorithm and operating on the same um, vertices, right? And uh, because here we are updating certain values, the distance in this case, we have to do it in an atomic way. We have to do it um, uh, to make sure that we don't um, have data races or something like that. So what we, what we, uh, many implementations typically do is using locks, and um, and with with uh, this lock, you uh, it's it's similar to a, a mutex in, in in parallel programming. Um, you can um, you define a critical section that is only accessible by one thread when this thread. Um, is done with the computation here, it releases the lock, right? And then another thread can access uh, the same um, data elements. But this synchronization is necessary, as you see, and this synchronization might not be uh, easy or uh, lightweight to implement. There are different ways of doing it. We are going to propose, or we propose a way of doing it for near uh, data processing architectures, similar to the one that you have on the screen. Uh, an NDP system that is composed by many or several NDP units and inside each of the NDP units, we have uh, multiple NDP cores. Each of the NDP cores is a, either in order, I mean, either a general purpose programmable core or an accelerator and may have its own private cache. If you uh, take a look, if you ch uh, um, uh, check this system or this proposed baseline architecture that we consider, you can see that is very similar, for example, to the uh, Tesseract accelerator, right? Also composed by uh, different NDP units, which are the different 3D stack um, cubes. And then inside the logic layer of each NDP unit, there are multiple uh, processing in memory cores. Uh, and uh, this uh, synchronization um, imposes uh, like hard challenges to solve because of several reasons. For example, First of all, uh, in, in, in many of these uh, processing in memory systems, most of them, I would say, there is uh, no hardware support for cache coherence. Even if you think about the Conda paper, because maybe some of you may be asking yourself, oh, why not using Conda? Okay, yeah, in Conda, we partly solve the problem with memory coherence, but we solve the problem of memory coherence between the memory side and the host side, right? Not across. Um, uh, PIM cores. And actually, if I recall correctly, in the Conda paper, the assumption was that in the memory side, 
the Messi protocol was used. But anyway, you can and and that uh, uh, as you as you know entails some um, uh, non negligible overhead. So uh, we need to find a better way of synchronizing cores, and um, we start from the assumption that there is no um, hardware support for cache coherence in, pro in processing in memory systems. Um, we also know that the communication across NDP units is quite expensive. This is also something that we mentioned when discussing uh, Tesseract. If you have to go from this NDP unit to this NDP unit, you have to go through an off-chip um, off link, and that's not cheap. And then uh, an important constraint is that there is normally no shared level of cache for the different NDP cores and from the different NDP units, right? And that's uh, something that, yeah, we like, can generally assume for processing in memory systems uh, because uh, they you can see them as distributed systems, each of them with its own memory space and its own processors, right? So there is no a shared, not even shared memory. So there is uh, no, no shared level of cache. So uh, because of these constraints, we uh, cannot use the um, an NDP synchronization solution that is based on shared memory as many uh, of these uh, synchronization solutions used in the past. We have to use a synchronization solution use of message passing. Message passing. Um, one work that uses one of these is Tesseract, but it uses a software-based uh, scheme. And here we propose a specialized hardware to support this um, synchronization uh, among NDP cores. Um, there are several techniques that uh, Synchron implements like hardware support, uh, direct buffering, a hierarchical uh, message passing communication as you will see in the next slides, and also a way of uh, managing uh, the uh, over potential overflow, possible overflow. You can uh, find all the details in the paper for sure, but let's um, quickly take a look at how it works. We assume that we have uh, two different NDP units and, and there are several cores in each of these NDP units running some um, execution threads. At some point, they may um, require to perform some uh, synchronization, for example, acquiring a lock and, uh, and we need to deal, or we have to deal with this, or we want to deal with this without uh, these um, um, issues here, without coherence protocol, uh, without atomic operations and at low hardware cost. And that's why we extend each of the NDP units with a synchronization engine. And inside, e and inside the synchronization engine, we have a synchronization processing unit that is going to be in charge of um, making the necessary updates to the um, synchronization variables, like for example, locks. And there is also uh, one uh, synchronization table to keep track of all the synchronization requests that are arriving from the cores in the same NDP unit. And so you can see uh, this is uh, one example of a uh, lock acquire operation and the uh, synchronization engine uh, keeps track of it in the synchronization table. Good thing of this, because we have this synchronization table that uh, can be, for example, SRAM based memory. We don't have costly memory accesses uh, to main memory to uh, perform this operation. And we can also do it uh, with low latency, right? Because the synchronization table is near the um, synchronization unit. Um, and here you can see an example of the hierarchical communication in an NDP system with multiple NDP units. We will have one synchronization engine, which will have uh, the will be considered the master because it's uh, residing closer to the variable, to the specific synchronization variable that we need to work with. And um, every time that the NDP cores in one NDP unit uh, have sort of synchronization requests, like for example, a uh, lock acquire, they send it to, the, uh, to their own, uh, to their local synchronization engine. And this local synchronization engine merges in some way these different requests and send them to the uh, global uh, synchronization engine, to the master synchronization engine that will uh, coordinate the execution. It will coordinate the sharing of this lock in this case. Um, this minimizes, um, uh, memory traffic. This kind of um, this kind of uh, hierarchical approach, right? Because instead of having all cores sending the request to the master engine, we first send the request to the local engine, and then from the local engine to the master engine. So, 
In summary, Synchron is the first end-to-end -end synchronization solution for NDP architectures, and it has uh, uh, really good benefits in terms of uh, performance, low hardware cost, programming ease, because we essentially don't need to change the programming model. It's just um, new, some uh, new instructions in the ISA to do the synchronization is in Synchron, and uh, it provides a general, uh, general synchronization support. And uh, as we said in the beginning, these are the performance results. You can check many more results because it's a paper with uh, a lot of experimentation. You can find many more results uh, for uh, different use cases in the paper. But yeah, I would say that the um, key um, um, outcome here and the key results here is that uh, Synchron achieves uh, performance and energy um, consumption very similar to an ideal scenario with zero overhead in synchronization. And this is the paper and, and here you can find the links to the uh, paper. Are there any questions, any other additional questions about uh, Synchron or about Conda? Okay, so if not, I'm going to continue. More things that need to be enabled for the adoption of PIM. We talked um, a few slides ago about uh, virtual memory support. There are not really many proposals in this uh, direction, uh, but uh, yeah, this is uh, one uh, proposal, one paper from our group that uh, proposes a way of dealing with virtual memory support um, inside the memory because that's necessary for the um, uh, pointer chasing operations. Uh, actually, in this paper, uh, it's, it's called uh, Impica, the, 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 the type of cores that are pr uh, proposed and, and employed near the memory are called Impica, and they are divided into two types of cores. In one of them, uh, we perform the address translation, while in the other one, uh, we perform the actual computations. You can uh, find more details in the, in the paper. And then we also, um, need to deal with uh, data structures in memory, right? And, and this paper, uh, we propose efficient ways of doing concurrent data structures, uh, updating uh, data structures concurrently um, in memory. Really uh, interesting work as well with a, with a nice theoretical analysis. And we also talk about the need for simulation, I mean, in general, infrastructures for processing in memory. Like for example, simulators. One simulator that we have extended for processing in memory is Ramulator. Um, Ramulator is, as you may know, is a flexible and extensible DRAM simulator that supports many different memory standards and, and proposals, and it's publicly available in, in our repository. And as I said, uh, we uh, created a version called Ramulator Ping that you can access from here that um, uh, that um, yeah uses Ramulator for uh, processing in memory simulation. And we even have a newer version of Ramulator PIM that is called the Move Sim and, uh, and comes from this paper, uh, which was, uh, we have published also this year, this work uh, led by Geraldo in which we propose a new methodology to analyze data move and bottlenecks. And as a result of this new methodology and, and all the work that we did uh, in this work, analyzing more than 300 applications with more than uh, 77,000 functions, um, we uh, came up with a benchmark suite, a collection of workloads that represent different types of data movement bottlenecks and can be used for later studies on near data processing or processing in memory. As I said, uh, there is a benchmark suite as a result, as a byproduct of this work, and also a simulator, and both are uh, publicly available. Let's very quickly, it's, it's possible that we talk about this demo paper in a later session, in a later lecture, but let me very, very quickly explain you how uh, it works. It's a, the methodology works. It's a three step methodology. The first thing that we do, I mean, we start from one program or several programs or uh, complete applications that we want to analyze to understand their uh, data movement bottlenecks and, 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 and figure out whether there is a, some opportunity for processing in memory acceleration, for example, or other uh, data movement mitigation techniques. So the first thing that uh, we would do is analyzing different sections of the uh, different functions of the application, doing some profiling in order to identify some 
um, characteristics that are already uh, uh, already indicate that the workload might suffer from certain data movement bottleneck. And, um, and after that, after having, let's say, selected one function of interest or one region of interest in our program, uh, we use the Damove Sim tool or the Damove Sim simulator to start analyzing in much more detail this specific part of the workload. We first generate some memory traces to um, do this analysis of the memory accesses of the region of interest. And then, then we do some so-called locality-based clustering, which is in reality quite independent on the, on, of the architecture, both the host architecture or the ping architecture. It analyzes the code in a independent, uh, the memory access in, in, a, in an architecture independent manner. And then we have a, a third step that is actually architecture dependent and where we um, go deeper into the analysis and classify the memory bottlenecks based on a uh, scalability analysis where we um, sweep the number of cores uh, that we use for the execution on both uh, the um, processing, on both the host side and, and also the simulated processing in memory side to see how the workload behavior evolves or changes when uh, we change the number of cores when we change the uh, compute power that the workload might potentially enjoy in a system with either host processors or uh, processing near memory processors. And after that, we come up with some classification of the uh, particular workload. And, um, and ba based on some metrics, and uh, we um, end up, uh, we, we ended up founding, finding um, six different classes of workloads, which have uh, similarities um, uh, between them. Uh, some of these workloads are more memory bound, some are more bandwidth bound, some are more uh, dependent on the latency, so they suffer more from, uh, from uh, the, the, the long latency of access to memory. In other cases, they are more compute bound, but even those that are more compute bound at some point uh, may saturate the bandwidth and may and become um, memory bound for a certain number of cores and so on. And for all these different classes, there might be different ways of dealing with the specific data movement bottleneck. And in the paper, you can find many recommendations in this direction. As I said, uh, we may uh, talk about this DAMOV paper in more detail in a later lecture. For now, uh, you, can, um, you can find the paper here, the link to the paper here. Um, also accessible the uh, the move benchmark suite and the simulator, and as well as um, a couple of videos where Geraldo explains the work uh, with uh, uh, different degrees of uh, depth. And also related to this, because in the end it's uh, important to understand the workloads and, and 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 figure out whether they are good for processing in memory or not. In the end you are, or we want to extend our computing systems with uh, some additional uh, capabilities. In this case, placing uh, compute units near memory. And, uh, and, uh, and it's important to understand the workloads well, as we have done with the move paper, uh, but also um, even if it's possible in a lightweight manner, figure out what's the benefit that we can obtain from a potential use of processing in memory, right? Uh, in the previous work that I presented in the move, um, we are using a simulator, right? And whenever we find some uh, part of an application that seems to be suitable for processing in memory because we detect that it suffers from a certain data movement bottleneck, um, we perform a simulation. We, we simulate or uh, a system with um, a certain number of thin cores, and then we evaluate how much benefit we can, or these particular workloads can, uh, go workload can get from uh, processing in memory capabilities. But doing simulation is, um, uh, it takes time, right? And in, in many, many cases, depending on how complex the application are or how, uh, or how complex or how large the, the, the data sets are, simulation might take uh, many, many hours. So it's not 
really a very practical way of uh, evaluating the potential benefits of processing in memory for one particular workload. And this is why uh, Gagan work on these machine learning based uh, performance and energy models for processing in memory that he presented in TAC, uh, TAC 2019, right? So here the idea is to um, use one machine learning technique in particular uh, assemble learning, uh, actually random forest, uh, the random forest algorithm uh, to uh, first um, yeah, train a method that identifies uh, the, what are the, the key characteristics of the applications that make it suitable for processing in memory. And then after having done this training, um, uh, he analyzes many different workloads and, and can um, see whether one workload is good for PIM or not. In this case, uh, he uh, so we, we show very good uh, um, performance and energy estimations compared to the execution in a simulator. And as you can find in the paper, being like two thousand times faster or so. So this is uh, in the in, in 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 the estimation of the performance and the energy, as I explained. So yeah, I think also really interesting paper, and I would recommend you to take a look at it as well. And uh, talking about infrastructures, one other infrastructure that can be used for PIM and has actually been used for PIM is SoftNC, um, this um, um, FPGA-based memory controller that I mentioned in our previous lecture, lecture just uh, in, in the processing using memory lecture yesterday, because the authors of this compute DRAM paper, uh, this, this uh, group that um, has shown the possibility of doing processing using DRAM in real chips, uh, they use this uh, soft NC. And um, so it's uh, for sure a very uh, useful and, and practical way of uh, doing some processing in memory studies and also a system that can be extended to make more uh, complete uh, and end-to-end -end processing in memory studies. And also another uh, simulator from our group that uh, can be used in this case, not for processing in memory, but for processing in storage in SSDs uh, is uh, MQSIM, also uh, quite a, a recent simulator and, and actually quite a good one as well. And then we continue looking for applications and use cases that can benefit from PIN, right? We, we were talking about um, the move, we were talking about NAPL as ways of identifying parts of uh, codes that, or applications that are suitable for processing in memory. This is a, a good uh, example of new application and use case for processing in memory. Uh, green filter is a processing in memory proposal for a fast seed location filtering in DNA read mapping. Um, in the uh, green filter paper, um, the, the, the key the idea is to accelerate uh, genome read mapping by applying um, the uh, processing in memory to a certain operation in this um, uh, read mapping, in this uh, approximate string matching problem. And, um, and the idea is to accelerate one uh, part of this uh, operation, which is a uh, filtering, which uh, somehow um, uh, rejects, I mean, yeah, filters, uh, get rid of some unnecessary uh, uh, computations that uh, would be needed for the uh, mapping problem uh, and selects, pre-selects those um, uh, string matching uh, problems that really need to be solved to do the appropriate uh, read mapping. And, and uh, by using 3D stack memories, uh, the paper shows very good speed up with almost four times uh, speed up for the specific filter, filtering application that is uh, implemented near the memory. Google workloads, another good example of new applications that can benefit from processing in memory. There are, um, yeah, some some people think, for example, think for example that they don't. So processing in memory is not suitable for mobile devices, or not really necessary in mobile devices, and um, and, and and even uh, they are uh, more uh, focusing on on doing research for servers for uh, cloud, etc. In the in this Google workload paper, uh, we show that 
consumer applications can also benefit from processing in memory as well. And other new applications as well, like uh, weather prediction modeling, I mentioned this uh, earlier in this lecture, or genome sequence analysis with the uh, Genasem work that we published last year, or acceleration of time series analysis, um, NASA also presented last year. But if you want to read a good summary of all these papers, and also all the challenges and open problems that they still need to be solved uh, in the area of processing in memory. Recall this book chapter, A Modern Primer on Processing in Memory, and also uh, these other two papers, uh, this one from the Micro Journal and this one in the IBM Journal of Research and Development uh, that I believe are, uh, will be very inspiring readings. So the main goal is to fundamentally uh, build uh, energy efficient data centric computing architecture, uh, high performance computing architectures, computing with minimal data movement. Um, we know one important takeaway is that the main memory needs intelligent memory controllers, and we want to enable this paradigm shift. So, recall in uh, computer architecture today, there are new ways of uh, revolutionizing uh, the computers, the way that we, we build computers, inventing new paradigms for computation, communication, or storage, etc. cetera. Um, processing in memory is one of these new paradigms. It's not really a new paradigm because as you know, we talked yesterday about that, uh, more than 50 years ago, uh, the first processing in memory proposals appeared but it's now when this paradigm is becoming new in real systems. And um, a, a very good reading uh, uh, recommended for sure for probably Professor Moodle already recommended this one is the structure of scientific re revolutions from uh, Thomas Kuhn. And here you have uh, yeah, a picture of the book. And processing in memory, as I said, it's uh, this new paradigm is now becoming a reality. We have talked already about the first real world processing in memory architecture, the AppMem PIM architecture or processing in DRAM architecture is actually near DRAM, as I said, because as you know, because I think I explained this yesterday, we have multiple PIN chips and the PIN chips, we have DRAM memory arrays and small processors near the banks called uh, DPUs. As I said, uh, we will uh, talk in more detail about this architecture in our, our next uh, meeting. And here you see uh, the picture of the uh, machine with the PIM enabled memory DIMMs. And also uh, the recent um, announcement from Samsung, PIM DRAM architecture, uh, what in this case, uh, remember, uses um, HVM2 memory, placing in each of the layers of the memory some compute units called PCU blocks that are connected to, uh, in, in this case, a couple of memory banks. And more recently, the AX team uh, processing in memory architecture that um, it's like, um, it's also near data processing, but in this case is not near bank, it's uh, on the DIM because we have this AX buffer, AX team buffer near the memory chips on the same DIM. So um, in conclusion, this is uh, a matter of uh, enabling new ideas with a certain goal. In this case, our goal is making the systems higher performance and higher energy efficiency and lower latency in summary computing uh, architectures with minimal data movement. Because in the end, we have seen that this data movement and we see it in many, many important workloads these days this data movement is uh, a key, a, a main bottleneck uh, in computing systems uh, in terms of energy efficiency and performance. And some uh, concluding remarks when it comes to doing, uh, to making these proposals in this case in processing in memory, but this is applicable not only to other topics in computer architecture, but I believe in general, um, when we talk about research in many different disciplines, it's important to do whatever you do based upon principle and not upon precedent. I'm pretty sure that Professor Mulu uh, has already explained this um, uh, key idea to you. Uh, principle design is more uh, useful and will produce definitely better outcomes than precedent design. And you should have in whatever you do some 
kind of overarching principle. In the case of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, works is the organic architecture. In the case of um, Calatrava is the uh, zoomorphic architecture, but in the end, do it based on principle and not based in precedent. And the um, key question here is what's the overarching principle for computing? I think that one overarching principle for computing is minimizing the amount of data movement to make the systems much more efficient in terms of energy consumption and performance. So it's time for uh, the design of principal system architectures that solve the memory problem, design the complete systems to be balanced, high performance and energy efficient, and that is something that we can achieve if uh, we make the systems more data centric or more memory centric with different uh, techniques, like, for example, the techniques that we have discussed about in, in, in processing in memory, but there may be other, other ways as well. And uh, the key idea in processing in memory is enabling the computation capability inside the memory or close to the memory. And this way we can obtain orders of magnitude performance improvements and energy savings, enabling uh, new applications and computing platforms um, and enable better understanding uh, of nature and many other things. And uh, the future of processing in memory for sure is bright. Uh, we believe so. And we think that after 50 years or, of very interesting research, uh, we see the true outcomes in reality with these newly announced processing in memory architectures. And regardless of the challenges the, and, and, and the, the, the underlying technology and, and problems processing in memory can enable order of magnitudes improvements, new applications and computing systems. But this is a problem, it's a, a, a paradigm that requires us, uh, requires us to rethink the whole computing stack to enable these new ideas and these new proposals. So uh, keep that in mind. And, um, and uh, yeah, I hope that you um, find these uh, um, lectures uh, interesting and the, and the topic interesting for sure. Uh, good principles, uh, in, in order to summarize the many things that I'm saying, data-centric system design, all components, being intelligence, also memory, it's, uh, it's enough uh, with uh, these dumb memories that can only store data, uh, better cross-layer communication and better interfaces across different components of the system, and, uh, and do something that is better than the worst case scenario, right? And this can be done by uh, enabling the heterogeneity in the system. And one form of heterogeneity is uh, processing in memory as well, but there may be other ways uh, as well, like different types of accelerators or specialized uh, compute units that make the, the system more flexible and more adaptable to the real needs of the, of the workloads. Uh, key, um, um, uh, key thing here is to be open-minded when uh, working uh, with these uh, systems and, and research proposals. And, uh, and just to wrap up, if you are in doubt about uh, how useful processing in memory can be, you can think about other doubtful technologies, like for example, um, flash memory-based SSDs. In the beginning, they were also not so successful and you see they started uh, to being um, studied uh, in, in in the 60s uh, but yeah it took many years to enable them in real systems but though nowadays they are uh, completely ubiquitous and also your laptop your cell phone and uh, and any other computing devices have uh, flash memory so processing in memory will end up probably being something like the same maybe uh, more difficulties in the beginning, um, some difficulties for adoption, as we discussed, um, we have discussed in today's lecture and uh, this paper as well. But in the end, uh, we believe that the technology will succeed. And this is the other uh, recommended papers. And I think that I am done for now. And, um, and I can take questions uh, if you uh, still want to, uh, uh, to ask something.
Okay, uh, Geraldo, Lois, are there any questions in YouTube or uh, in the lecture room? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I hope that's good. It means that everything is clear and you understood everything. Um, and I hope that at least the key ideas are are clear and and uh, for sure uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact any of us or send me an email if you want to ask uh, any specific questions. You know that uh, we also have like um, uh, Q and A forums that you can use to ask questions, but uh, feel free to uh, reach me over email if you want to clarify anything or. Uh, or also, um, I don't know, this, maybe discuss uh, potential ideas as well. Okay, a few more seconds in case that someone has a last minute question. And if there are no other questions, then I think uh, we are done. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. I think I will see you again next uh, Thursday. Uh, I, I will do my best to be in the lecture room. I think that this, uh, the experience is going to be different, probably better. Uh, this time I couldn't do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, if I, if I teach next Thursday, I. I will see you in person in the lecture room. Um, again, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. I hope that you uh, got something useful from these two lectures about processing in memory. And I hope to see you all soon. And I hope that you guys have a 